See, the whole idea about thermal efficiency is to maximize the heat energy that is there in the fuel. So most of the heat energy that is there in the in the fuel is largely absorbed in terms of work. Now, thermal efficiency and compression ratio in comparison for diesel engine and petrol engine is completely different matters. That's the way it is. You cannot compare, compare thermal efficiency and diesel engine efficiency for two of them. The idea is thermal efficiency, whatever input is there, how much of it is converted into work. That's the way it is. But you can't really compare that the thermal efficiency of a petrol engine is higher in spite of the compression ratio being lower. You can't really compare the two. They don't have any relationship that way. If you say thermal efficiency and diesel engines, okay, they have some value there. Or how much of heat energy is converted into work? But in the case of petrol engine, the speed at which it works is much faster. One minute. Let me first take down all everybody's attendance. Everybody is coming in right now. I'm a little uh, occupied with this particular area. Yes, sir. There's 24 of them. Okay, everybody is coming in, so I'm trying to print a off moment. I try to type something, somebody is coming in. Okay, oh, there's somebody more. Uh, okay, please. You. Write your. Registration numbers in the All right, guys, you'll have to write your yes, they've started writing. You'll have to write your registration numbers because at the end of the class, we need to take an attendance record. And it's become very, very important because IMU headquarters is continuously trying to monitor the number of students that are attending classes. They have to give their reports to DG Shipping on the efficacy, efficacy of this particular online coaching. So if we are able to show them that it is satisfactory that most of the boys, 90% plus, are attending classes, then they are going to accept it as your MTM, Maritime Training Institute program, as being a successful program. But if the students don't attend, then and we just pass them on the basis of some flimsy test, then they are not going to accept. They need to see that the attendance has been satisfactory and the students have been given coaching or classes satisfactorily. So that is why your attendance is very, very important. It's not that you will be penalized if you can't attend class. That's not the point. The point is they want to certify your BTEC course program as being satisfactorily conducted in spite of these pandemic times. And for that, we need to submit 
the attendance records and there is no dodging of the attendance record because everything is recorded so even if i don't give the correct record they can find out from the record that has already been put up on the drive so apart from my record they also have a record from the computer so there's no dodging of the program we cannot deceive dg shipping in our reports to them also so it's better best to stay in line and follow up on what has been required by dg shipping regulation otherwise soon this particular btech course will be de recognized if we don't conduct it satisfactorily if the students don't attend then the whole course will be de recognized at the worst of course it doesn't happen so quickly but if it continues with very poor attendance in class they might say sorry we cannot approve of the course being satisfactory as such you will have to conduct this semester once again so the whole semester will have to be repeated i'm considering the worst case scenario so best is to stay safe best is to stay in line with the demands of dg shipping so that your btech course is also done in absolute honesty and you are attending class to the best so we in our last class oh there was a question from sarthaki sarthaki will deal with this a little later let us finish with it because we don't really deal with petrol engines as much but we deal strictly on diesel engines so stay a little yes, focus sir. on diesel engines and we'll continue so yes, sir. They, okay right now what we are going to go through is improve your information and technical vocabulary regarding engines you need to know the names of all the parts of the engine to be able to discuss the subject as well as write technical reports so your preliminary stage of learning this subject is getting familiar with all the names of the parts of the engine and the terms related to the functioning of the engines so that is why as we have in our syllabus also you have to follow on the basis of your syllabus also general description of ic engines and i am required to spend 13 hours on that particular area so i am going to be able to give you in some detail the names of the parts the material they are constructed of and how they function and why they are designed the way they are that's the way it is going to be all right so the main principal components are the bed plates the a frames in two stroke engines the four stroke engines do not have a frames really they have what is called engine blocks and this engine block is actually a housing for the cylinder liner or the jacket and this cylinder block also has arrangement to accommodate the camshaft and apart from that the block itself has several i don't think you can see my camera on no oh yes camera is on okay uh, apart from have housing the cylinder liner arranging for cooling etc they have holes drilled through the block and the necessity of using pipes is reduced if you have holes drilled through the block itself they act as pipelines for delivery of fuel air water whatever is required for the functioning of that engine all right so four stroke engines or medium feed engines do not have a frames two stroke engines have a frames largely to accommodate the length of the stroke because it is long and to accommodate the crossing okay so cylinder apart from that you have cylinder heads cylinder heads are the topmost part of the engine which covers the combustion space and within this cover you have what are called mountings these mountings are similar to boiler mountings in the term used it is like having several fittings on top of the mounting and the four main fittings are if you have a piece of paper and or, or a register beside you write down these points because we won't be dealing so much in detail with the mountings as such so what you need to know you need to have the information regarding what are mountings on the cylinder head of a diesel engine so the mountings on the diesel head diesel engines cylinder head for a two stroke engine are the four principal ones you can write them down first one you can write air starting valve first one is air starting valve the second one you can write as fuel injector all right 
Apart from that, you have a relief valve, a relief valve. You don't call it a safety valve. The valve on the boiler is called a safety valve and the valve on the cylinder cover is called a relief valve. Why it is so is a very, you know, controversial point. The difference between a safety valve and a relief valve, very difficult to define, but we'll come to it later. So you have first is the air starting valve, second is the fuel injector, third is the relief valve, and the fourth is the indicator cock. These four are standard mountings on the cylinder cover. Some cylinder covers also have an exhaust valve. So that exhaust valve could also be considered as a mounting. So these are the five on the two-stroke engine. In the case of the four-stroke engine, you will have a rocker arm assembly also included. The inlet and outlet valves are also included. And sometimes even the guides which allow the valve to function are included in the mountings because they are also an additional fitting on the cylinder head. But the four standard ones are also there in the four-stroke cylinder head. The air starting valve, the fuel injector, the relief valve, and the indicator cock. These four are standard. That is common for two-stroke as well as four-stroke. In the two-stroke, you may have an exhaust valve fitted. If you have an exhaust valve fitted, obviously you will not have the exhaust ports on the cylinder liner. And in the four-stroke engine, you will have the inlet outlet valves together with the rocker arm assembly. A rocker arm assembly would mean <clears throat> there is a bush on the fulcrum where it rotates and there is a tappet bolt which actually works the valve to press it down. Okay. Somebody has come. So let me just pull it down. Yeah, Sagar Date. How many are there? 36. Shashank Shikar. 30, is still showing 37. So actually, how many boys are there in class? This is section E, no? Section E has 38. 38. And that is two of me, so 40. So that figure over there should show 40, which means there are two boys still absent. Shubankar Singh, I hope you're keeping a record because at the end of the class, I will need to find out how many boys are absent. So don't leave the class in the middle because you'll be marked absent in the end. So stick on with the class. Okay, right on. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay good. So where were we? We were talking about cylinder head mountings. Mountings are fittings which are fitted on top of the cylinder cover or the cylinder head. The cylinder head is also called a cylinder cover. So there are sometimes common names for the same item. So you have to be a little watchful. Sometimes cylinder head is called cylinder cover. Okay, next is cylinder liner. The cylinder liner is part of the engine which is considered a consumerable part. Any part which is subject to wear down and change after a certain period of time is called a consumerable part. At the end of the class, I will put a question to you. Name five consumerable parts of a diesel engine. All right. So cylinder liner would be one of them. Then there is uh, the cylinder liner is fitted inside in which the piston operates. The cylinder liner is an integral part of the engine and it is cooled from the outside. This cylinder liner is held in place by means of the cylinder jacket. The cylinder jacket is also called the entablature. This entablature is called a cylinder jacket also. This also has got two different names and it can be used as required. Both are acceptable. In the next, what we have is the piston assembly. Piston by itself is the piston, but piston assembly means a lot more. The piston assembly consists of the piston in the two-stroke engine. We are talking about the two-stroke engine right now. It consists of the piston crown. It consists of the piston skirt. All right. Apart from that, it has piston rings. And from, apart from the piston ring, you have the piston rod. So that is what constitutes a piston assembly. The piston rod, the piston skirt, the piston crown, and the piston rings. So one, two, three, four parts are there in the two-stroke engine. In the four-stroke engine, you don't really have a skirt 
you have a trunk portion but that piston is a single piece piston in common medium speed four stroke engines the more detailed engines will have the piston in two parts but that is much later as of now the piston assembly in the four stroke engine consists of the piston by itself the piston rings the gudgeon pin gudgeon pin the gudgeon pin bush and the connecting rod so that is what constitutes the piston assembly in the four stroke engine once you know the names of these parts then you can actually describe it very comfortably next what we have is the crosshead everybody has now seen what is the crosshead and uh, its function is to connect the piston rod and the con connect uh, piston rod and the connecting rod and enable vertical motion of the piston and angular motion while reciprocating of the connecting rod so it is a it is a jointing it is a joint basically and it also helps in translating the forces between the angular force and the transverse force and this force is transmitted by the crosshead onto the guide and guide shoe okay next what we have is the connecting rod and bottom end bearing connecting rod is the extension of the drive system from the crosshead and this connecting rod is common for four stroke engine as well as two stroke engines this two stroke engine the connecting rod is connected at one end with the crosshead and the other end is at the crank pin bearing or bottom end bearing or big end bearing now this bottom end bearing it is got three different names or terms one is big end bearing one is bottom end bearing and one is crank pin bearing all mean the same all right now this is for the two stroke engine in the four stroke engine the connecting rod connects the piston directly with the crank pin of the crank shaft all right and last not yet last second last is crank shaft the crank shaft has basically three components the crank pin the crank webs and the main journals the crank pin uh, provides for the bottom end bearing to hold the connecting rod the crank web is the connector between the crank pin and the main journal and of course the main journal is that portion of the shaft which rests in the bed plate with the main bearings the main bearing the thin shell bearings and last but not least what we have is the cam shaft the cam shaft is a shaft separate from crank shaft and it is the crank shaft which drives the cam shaft via chains or it may have gear drive gear wheels with drive and remember the ratio of rpms of the crank shaft to the cam shaft in the case of the two stroke engine the cam shaft speed and crank shaft speed is the same whereas in the four stroke engine the crank shaft speed is twice the speed of the cam shaft all right this must not be forgotten under any circumstances and don't mix up the two the moment you mix up the two the examiner will know that you are not thorough with your subject tie rods last is tie rod but i don't really know where to place it but i put it at the end because ultimately when you know the names of the other part you will know the function of the tie rod the tie rod purpose is to hold three components under compression the bed plate the a frame and the entablature or cylinder jacket these three are held together by means of a bolt this bolt is called a tie rod and this tie rod can be anything between 30 to 40 feet in length and both the ends are threaded to accommodate nuts all right so when this tie rod goes through the bed plate it goes through the a frame it goes through the entablature so that is why it is 30 to 40 feet tall or long and at the same time it is about 20 cm in diameter it's about 1 to 2 tons each tie rod weighs about 1 to 2 tons depending on the size of the engine and you need cranes to lift it up you cannot simply lift it up by chain block or something you need a proper crane so these tie rods are intended to hold the engine in compression and maintain the alignment of the components one of the most important parameters for an engine is to have accurate alignment of all the parts once they are aligned and tightened 
firmly then during its vibration also they will not shift from each other because if the alignment goes out of order the entire engine is going to have enormous resistance to motion within and a lot of power will go in and then there will be damages that is it so these are the names of the major parts of the engine of course i have not touched upon fuel pumps fuel injectors and other parts so these are the principal parts which we will be describing and as we go along we will go into the other items also now once again i'm showing you that same diagram to get you familiar with the layout of a two stroke engine and a trunk type of engine this is two stroke engine is a crossed engine a two stroke engine remember need not be a crossed engine the requirement of a crossed is principally because of the stroke if the stroke is large then the angularity of the connecting rod will foul with the bottom part of the liner so to avoid this fouling you need to have an extension of the piston and this extension of the piston is provided by the help of the piston rod so that piston rod allows the position for the connecting rod to be fitted much lower thereby the angularity that arises when the piston is at mid stroke angularity of that connecting rod will not foul with the bottom part of the liner all right that is why we need a cross head so this question this is one question you will be asked quite often why do we need a cross head in a two stroke engine you should be able to explain very very clearly why this two stroke engine because it has a long stroke it requires a cross head if the two stroke engine was had a short stroke then it doesn't need a cross head all right this is one in the four stroke engine generally four stroke engines do not have a very long stroke and they do not require a cross head on account of that that's all in the two stroke engine the under piston spaces and cabin spaces are separated by a diaphragm which is called which is which is the diaphragm and within which you have a stuffing box or a piston rod seal now this under piston space is under pressure for one thing so that pressurized air should not enter the crankcase number 2 the cylinder oil which is used for lubricating the piston and liner is a one time use oil that means what oil is injected here for lubrication of the liner falls to the bottom whatever little is not burnt or discharge with the exhaust falls to the bottom which is partly oxidized it is sticky it is gummy and carbonized so it is not usable again so from the stuffing box area you have an a drain a pipeline which allows for that dirty oil or contaminated oil to be drained into a sludge tank so this oil can never be used again in it has to be discarded it has to be discarded either through slop tank or it has to be burnt through the incinerator so remember cylinder oil is a one time use oil and it is chemically and physically different from the crankcase oil the oil which is used for lubricating the cross head the bottom end bearing the main bearing the guide and guide shoe all these parts are lubricated continuously with a system oil this system oil is completely different from the cylinder oil chemically as well as physically physically it means the viscosity is different viscosity index is different the other properties are also there we will not deal with it right now but remember the so system oil which is also called crankcase oil is completely different from the cylinder oil in the case of a trunk type of engine it is the crankcase oil which is also lubricating the cylinder liner all right so that is why in the four stroke engine or in the trunk type of engine you regularly need to change the oil in the crankcase because the combustion debris which means various salts carbon ash and lot of combustion products are also sent into the crankcase by means of some amount of blow pass which takes place past the piston rings so this oil over a period of time tends to get contaminated and every few thousand hours on board the ship we used to do it every 3000 hours every 3000 hours of running you must 
must change the crankcase oil of the trunk type of engine. In the case of the two-stroke engine, you almost never need to change the system oil, the crankcase oil. One of the main reasons is it is isolated from the under piston spaces. There is no scope of any combustion debris coming and contaminating the crankcase oil. That is why you never need to change the oil. Apart from this, we have an arrangement which is like the kidneys of the body system. I had told you earlier that the system oil is similar to your blood system, much like your blood system. And in your body, you have what are called kidneys. And these kidneys are continuously purifying your blood and thereby throwing out the waste through urine. Similarly, for the crankcase oil, we have separate centrifugal purifiers which continuously take oil from the drain tank and again clean the oil and thereafter put it back into the drain tank. In the two-stroke engine, the oil which is in the crankcase falls in the sump, but it does not stay there. From the sump, there is a pipeline which goes to a separate tank, which is called a drain tank. And this drain tank is a very large tank. It is not a small tank. It is contained anything between 20,000 and 30,000 liters of lubricating oil. That's two to three tons of lubricating oil. The purifier draws oil from that tank, cleans it and puts it back into the tank. And a pump, electrical pump, which is outside the engine, draws the oil from that tank and sends it to the engine for lubrication. Once that parts are lubricated, the oil falls to the bottom. And at the bottom, from the sump, there is a pipeline which takes the oil back into the tank. So that is the circulation system in the two-stroke engine. Remember, remember, the crankcase oil does not need to be changed if it stays healthy. Never needs to be changed because it is in a continuous state of cleaning. There is some amount of loss, no doubt, from the crankcase door walls. There might be a little seepage. Apart from that, the volatile vapors of the lube oil sometimes evaporate. And what you have from the crankcase is called a breather pipe. This breather pipe opens to the atmosphere up in the funnel. So some amount of oil vapor escapes from there and goes into the atmosphere, which cannot be controlled. So that oil... Uh, replenishment is simply done by pouring a little more of oil. But that is very, very rarely. It sometimes takes one month before you can replenish the oil inside the crankcase. In the four-stroke trunk type of engine, that oil must be changed because the oil becomes acidic due to the combustion products contaminating that oil. All right. And because it does not have a diaphragm, so it has direct access to the combustion chamber. In the case of a two-stroke engine, it has a diaphragm which protects any, com any combustion debris or contamination of the lubricating oil. So this is the layout of the components. And what you see on the side are the guides for the crosshead. Now these guides, they, have, they need to have a certain support because transverse force which is acting at the crosshead is ultimately transferred to the guides. So the guides need to be supported also. That is not shown in this diagram. And um, this is the portion where the additional reinforcements are there against the A-frame. The A-frame walls are what ultimately takes up the transverse force. One particular area you will need to be aware of is that when the engine is rotating in a direct, or sorry, in the ahead direction, the transverse force can be at its maximum because normally a ship uses maximum RPM mostly to move forward. But it does not use such high RPM when it is astern movement. When the astern movement is there, the forces of the transverse forces are not as much as as they are during the ahead movement because you never go full speed astern You're, but more often you go full speed ahead so at full speed the transverse force in the ahead direction will be much more than in the astern direction so it doesn't make sense to make the forward and aft movement directions on the guides as strong as each other i'm not able to explain very well again let me try again. When the engine is moving in a head direction, 
it generally moves at almost full RPM. So higher the peak pressure, more the forces on the piston rod, connecting rod, etc. Likewise, the transverse force will be also be at its maximum when it is at its full RPM. This full RPM at a head direction will require a stronger support of the guide in the ahead direction. But on the astern direction, we never run at full RPM. So on the other side, you don't need to make it so strong. You understand? This is the support for the guide and guide too. So when you go to workshop next in college, do visit that engine we have at the back of our workshop and you check out how strongly the ahead direction of rotation for the guide and guide shoe is made in comparison to the astern direction of rotation for the same guide and guide shoe. Okay, so that is why you need a stronger A-frame in the case of a longer stroke. If the stroke is not so long, then you need certain amount because at the mid position of the piston, the angularity of the connecting rod will be the maximum. And more, more angularities bigger the transverse force. All right, let's move on with our other parts. About two stroke marine engines, they are mostly large. They are very large. Sometimes it's like a three story building or a one or four story building. It's as tall as that. Uh, the engine that we have in our workshop is not a very large engine, it is only 60 millimeter dia for the bore. And most of the engines are around one meter diameter. It is like a, most of you must have seen a well, a well where you take out water from in villages, in farms, etc. So each of those cylinders is like a well. You can physically enter that cylinder liner and you do require to enter the cylinder liner when you need to take the dimensions of the wear down of the cylinder liner. You'll be doing that at some stage of your work while on board. So anyway, these two stroke engines are mostly large, cross-head type, low speed, direct driven, residual fuel burning engines, and they are reversible. That means the engine by itself is directly driving the propeller. If the engine stops, the propeller stops. That's the way it is. And these engines can be reversed. It can move in ahead direction as well as astern direction. For that, you need a camshaft which can shift or you need an arrangement for the cams which are ahead cams and astern cams. We will come to this when we do the starting of the engine. Starting of the engine will first show you how the engine is rotated in one particular direction. If you want it in ahead direction, you want it certain set of cams to work. If you want it to rotate in the opposite direction, you need another set of cams which will ensure that the air entry into the cylinder is in sequence to have the engine running in the opposite direction. Okay, so they, these engines are generally reversible. It is not that other engines are not reversible. Most engines are reversible, but only engines which are not reversible are your auxiliary engines, which are used for electricity generation. They are not reversible. They run only in one direction. They don't have any reversing mechanism at all. But propulsion engines generally have a reversing mechanism because they require to run ahead and astern. Okay, quite easily understandable. Next, what we have is the bed plate. Now, the bed plate is the foundation of the engine. The bed plate, A-frames, and entablature. These are the three components, which I will show you by diagrams also, which are held together in compression by tie rods. Tie rods are long bolts, which are threaded at both ends, and uh, they are tensioned by means of hydraulically device, hydraulic devices. That will come later. So these three items, bed plate, A-frame, and entablature, which is also actually the cylinder jacket, they are held together in compression by tie rod. Guide and guide shoe enables alignment and sliding movement of the cross-head assembly. The piston has to move only in the vertical direction. All right. The connecting rod has to move at the top end in the vertical direction. And in the lower part of the connecting rod has to be in a rotary motion. 
so it is very essential that the crosshead be held in a mode which will allow it to reciprocate and stay in alignment with the central axis of the cylinder very very crucial apart from having this central alignment with the central axis of the cylinder the central axis must intersect the horizontal axis of the crankshaft exactly at the fixed point and this should be for all the units so that is why the alignment factor is very very crucial is very very crucial in the engine without this alignment you cannot have an efficient engine running you will have the engine in a very bad form where most of the power will be taken up by the engine and all the parts will also wear down by the engine all right can you i need about now it is 10 o'clock 04 we'll be back at 10 15 i need a break the cleaning person has come into my house yes, and, and uh, we excuse, get a, excuse, uh, excuse uh, me sir, uh, sir all the 38 uh, cadets are present right now in the class sir. Oh, that's very good that's very good. I'm giving you the thumbs up signal for a very good class. Give me five, ten minutes, about seven minutes, and I'll be back again. I need a break. They come to clean the room. Yes, sir. Duly noted. Okay. Stay online.
All right, guys, I'm back again in place. And I hope all of you, oh, good, all 40 are there. Okay, and I've got myself a glass of hot water. I hope you follow the drinking hot water and nothing chilled. At this time, with this pandemic in place, we never know what can happen and from where these aerosol particles can come along. And these aerosol particles with the virus are likely to hit you. So best is to stay away from anything that affects your throat. The throat is the first place that you get affected. So make it a habit to drink hot water whenever you can. Okay, let's start off where we left off. So this guide and guide shoe is very, very crucial in maintaining the alignment of the central axis tapping through the piston, through the liner, right down to the crank pin when it is at TDC or the center line of the crankshaft. If there is any misalignment, then the effort in rotating the crankshaft goes haywire and ultimately the power will be lost from the shaft output. Okay. Next is main bearings hold the crankshaft in alignment and in place. That's true. It's the, I have told you what the crankshaft is like and we will deal with the crankshaft in detail later, but the crankshaft is fitted in the bed plate. I have a diagram of the bed plate which will let you know what it looks like. Now here is a diagram of a bed plate and it is not a two-stroke engine really, it, is, it looks like a four-stroke engine because the bed plate is, looks a little small in its stature and it does not have so much of depth within. In a two-stroke engine, the depth will be much more. And um, what you have is the longitudinal gutter. This is the bed plate and this is the bottommost portion where foundation bolts are located at this region. These are the transverse girders. And these are the longitudinal girders. It is like a ladder. Consider a ladder with two long bamboos and the horizontal pieces of bamboo across. So it's like a ladder construction. And the longitudinal girders are generally fabricated. That means they are manufactured through mild steel. And the transverse girders are made of cast steel. Why they are of two different materials, I will explain to you just now. First, let's go back to where we were. Uh, uh, the main bearings hold the crankshaft in alignment and in place. Now, again, here alignment becomes a very important issue. If the crankshaft is not aligned, ultimately crankshaft will fail because the crankshaft is subject to fluctuating, alternating, reversing stresses. All the stresses which involve fatigue failure are involved with the crankshaft. When we deal with the crankshaft itself, I will give you a diagram how the forces are acting on the crankshaft. Okay, as of now, know the names of the parts and what is their function. What is the function of main bearing? It is used to hold the crankshaft in alignment and in place. What is the purpose of the guide and guide shoe? It enables alignment and sliding movement of the crosshead assembly. So all questions will be starting with what? At this level, till your class four examinations, all questions related to internal combustion engines, 90% will be what? What is the purpose of guide and cut you? What is the bed plate? What are the arrangement of holding the bed plates and the other components together? So all your questions will start with the term, what? When you graduate from class four to class two, your questions will change from what to why. Why are bed plate A-frames and entablatures held by means of tie rods? Why isn't there any other means? All right. Why is the guide and guide shoe necessary or the cross head. So the answers become a little more in detail. So right now, stick to what? All questions related with what? Okay. Okay. So you know from each of these statements, you can answer the question what? What is the purpose of the guide and cut? What does the guide and guide you do? What is the bed plate, A-frame and entablature 
how uh, what arrange what is the arrangement to hold the bed plate a frame entablature the question will be placed in that form so you have your answers readily written down here now to know the names and the functions of the other parts i have a little main parts of a two stroke engine the combustion space and cabin space are separated from the crankshaft by a diaphragm plate this already i have explained to you when i was explaining the two stroke engine this is just a revision to identify the names of the places or names of the parts and where they are located the piston rod is bolted to the piston and passes through the stuffing box okay we hold on for a second sayantan sengupta has a question is the drain tank and slop tank same no sayantan it is absolutely not the same a slop tank means something like a garbage tank oily garbage so slop tank is all the waste oil the dirty oil the contaminated oil from where it can never be used again that is a slop tank all right and drain tank is a clean oil tank which allows the oil from the sump of the engine to drain into that particular tank which is also like a storage tank this storage tank also has heating arrangements in the tanks by steam pipes so when the ship goes to very cold places that oil becomes very cold so you need to heat that oil before it starts so you do have arrangements with steam pipes at the bottom of the tank in uh, you know vv form that allow the oil to be warmed up before it can be circulated through the engine if the engine has been stopped over a long period of time but in practice we engineers on board never ever open that steam pipe why this is a secret you will not find in books or anywhere we never take the risk of opening a steam pipe heating arrangement in the lube oil sump in the lube oil drain tank why you see we can never trust these pipes if it is holed somewhere if it is leaking somewhere that steam will come out from there as water and it will contaminate that lube oil pipe especially in old ships no ship engineer will take the risk on the contrary he will blank those steam pipes and ensure that no steam or water ever enters those pipes for heating of the lube oil so what is the remedy the remedy is keep your lube oil centrifuge which is a purifier continuously on so that it takes oil from the sump it heats it up to 75 degrees purifies it and puts it back into the sump so if you have a continuous circulation that oil will remain warm or hot depending on what temperature you operate the purifier so that is the way we keep that drain tank oil clean warmed up and ready for use at any time a slop tank is where the waste oil tank is like from the cylinder all the oil which scrapes down to the bottom it is partly oxidized it is partly uh, mixed with the combustion debris that is ash salts etc rust sometimes rust is also there carbon so this is actually filthy oil absolutely dirty oil so that oil is drained out from the stuffing box area in to a separate pipe into a sludge tank or a slop tank so that slop tank is a tank for absolute dirty oil or waste oil to get in i hope that is clear with you santan santan okay right on let's move on so this is the diagram which shows the piston rod is bolted to the piston and passes through the stuffing box okay next is uh, i have a similar diagram which is a little better explained so you know the names of the parts this part in light blue is called the combustion uh, is the cabin space the dark blue space is the combustion space all right what is separating the scavenge and under piston spaces from the crankcase pieces is the diaphragm and on this diaphragm you have a sealing arrangement which is called the stuffing box or sometimes it is called the piston rod gland all right now below the stuffing box is the crankcase piece this is the clean oil area you cannot under any circumstances let the dirty oil which accumulates at the bottom come into this space i will tell you another little bit of interesting information 
you know, you might have heard of scavenge fires in the engines. And a dirty engine is liable to cause you a lot of grief, a lot of problems. How does it happen? Now, at this region, you generally have some amount of cylinder oil which has accumulated. As a junior engineer and as a watchkeeper, you are required to drain that oil regularly from that space by means of operating a valve. At least in the old ships, it was that was the procedure. Possibly in the new ships, they have an automatic drain. But don't don't rely on automatic drains also. This thick, it's 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 it's, a, it's very slimy. It is very thick, and if it cools, it solidifies. So the hazard is that oil must be hot so that it drains out. Moment it cools down in very cold climate, it starts becoming thicker. And if it becomes thicker inside the pipe, it will almost solidify. And then it won't drain. And if it doesn't drain, then the accumulation at this region becomes more and more and more. And if the piston rings start having a blow past, that means <coughs> if the piston rings are partially worn, there are chances that the hot gases with flame will pass the piston ring between the liner and the ring into the underside of the piston. And the oil over here, which is hot, will have some amount of volatile vapors. These vapors can catch fire. And once that oil catches fire, the fire spreads into the scaven spaces also. And if there is any carbon deposited in this place, the fire becomes a scavenge fire. And these fires are some of the her most horrible fires. They are very difficult to extinguish. And if it persists, what happens is the steel, the entire steel components of that engine starts getting red hot. And once it gets red hot, what happens is it starts getting distorted. You can cool it with water. And the first thing that will happen is the steel will start buckling. That means it will get cooled on one side and other side remains hot. So it will start buckling. And once it buckles, the entire alignment of the engine is destroyed. And once the alignment is destroyed, the piston will no longer be in its position. The piston rod uh, stuffing box will no longer be in alignment with the central axis. And then you have all the problems. And you will see, it is not the scavenge fire that is the worrisome factor. The main worrisome factor is after the scavenge fire is extinguished, when you run the engines. And then you find every day there is leakage of dirty oil into your crankcase. Your crankcase oil is getting dirty very fast. And then you find out that the piston rod gland is leaking. So then you take out the piston, overhaul the piston rod gland, put new sealing rings, etc. and run the engine. And very soon again you find it is getting dirty. Then it strikes you that this diaphragm plate has got distorted. And no amount of changing of the seals is going to bring back that alignment. Nothing, nothing. You can't do anything about it. It's crap. You'll have to change the entire, remove the engine, change the entire diaphragm plate. It's an extensive job, extensive job. And apart from this, possibly your jacket also will be affected to some extent. So this alignment factor, if it is distorted, it is a huge, huge problem for that engine. It, that engine can be scrapped. So it is very clean to keep your engines clean. Very important to keep your engines clean so that no chance of scavenge fire takes place. And one of the main reasons for scavenge fire is your piston ring malfunction or piston ring breakage or piston ring wear down because that is what ignites the possible contaminated oil which accumulates in this region. And if there is excess cylinder oil, some of that cylinder oil will escape into the scavenge manifold and settle inside the scavenge manifold. There again, the fire can extend if there is a blow past. It will blow past and come into the scavenge manifold. So if you have any matter which is combustible and in ignitable means, it will catch fire. Because air is in supply in full power. Full-fledged air is in supply. So that is why it is very crucial to ensure that this under piston space and scavenge manifold is always, always, always clean. So a clean engine is safe from any fire. All right. Okay. We are a little going off our topic.
but there are some interesting points which also need to be told to keep you absorbed. So scavenge fire are a hideous fire and the fire itself is not so scary even though I call it a hideous fire. It is post scavenge fire when the problems arise, when distortion of the engine has taken place on account of overheating of components. Okay, next let us go into the engine, two-stroke engine components. Let us start with the bed plate because this is the foundation of the engine. The bed plate is the foundation of the engine and large bed plates are actually fabricated. You cannot have large, huge castings. If at all they are castings, they will be made in a way where they can be joined together physically by bolts or studs or whatever. But large bed plates for two-stroke engines are fabricated, which means they are constructed. You will have, uh, let's read it first. The longitudinal box like girders are made of mild steel. The transverse girders are made of cast steel. Okay. Uh, Sayantan, tell me which do you think is stronger, the cast steel or a mild steel? Sayantan Sengupta. Hey, I hope you haven't disappeared. Sayantan Sengupta. Is my system working? Oh, yeah, it is working. Sayantan Sengupta, are you there or you vanished? Okay, Shubankar Singh, tell us, tell us, what, which one do you think is stronger? The transverse mild, girder? Mild steel. Mild, mild steel is stronger than cast steel. Uh, mild and uh, cast, we have the comparison between mild and uh, cast uh, steel, right sir? I am asking you, which do you think will be stronger, mild steel or cast steel? The tensile strength of mild steel is much more uh, greater in comparison to the cast steel, sir. No, sir, no, 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 no. Cast iron is the weakest one here. I'm not asking you about cast iron. Cast steel is definitely stronger and it can take much more of tensile stress than mild steel. Okay. Oh, now, okay, okay, okay. Sir, yes, steel, okay. Yes, sir. I, I, yes. It is not iron. I'm not, yes, there's sir. a distinction between, yes, cast between, iron. Iron, between iron and steel. Yes, sorry, yes. Sir. so be very careful. Sir, no, no, I don't have to be sorry. You be just aware. It is a learning process. You make a mistake, it doesn't matter. It doesn't yes. matter at all. So let it be a learning experience that mild steel is mild steel. Cast steel is definitely much, much stronger. Now, this large bed plates, they are fabricated in the sense that mild steel plates are cut, they are gas cut and they are welded together to make longitudinal boxes. They are like boxes. And transverse girders are transverse, uh, you can't call them plates really, they are cast. So they have a different shape, they are not just plates. So these transverse girders are what actually takes the bending forces. See, when there is, you now pay attention to this. The, I had told you earlier that it is the tie rods which hold the bed plate, A-frame and entablature together under compression. And the cylinder cover is mounted on top of the cylinder liner which is fitted inside the entablature. And this cylinder cover is held by studs on the entablature. So when the gas pressure inside the cylinder, uh, inside the combustion chamber takes place, there is force upward, there is force downward, and there is force circumferentially inside the liner also. The circumferential forces are balanced off because they are 360 degrees in all directions. But the upward forces and the downward forces, how are they held together? See, the upward forces under the cylinder cover will cause a stress on the studs which are fitted on the entablature. So ultimately, it is the entablature which is being pulled upwards because the cylinder cover is being pushed upwards. Now the entablature is held in place by means of stud, uh, by means of tie rods, and these tie rods are keeping the entablature down. Now the other side of the forces in the combustion chamber is on the piston. So when this piston is forced downward, the ultimate force comes on the connecting rod, the crank pin, and the bed plate because the crankshaft is ultimately getting the force downward and the 
crank shaft is resting in the bed plate so the bed plate is forced downward but what is keeping the bed plate upward the tie rods again i will show you a diagram which explains the forces and you will get to know what it means okay have a look at this this is the tie rod actually this diagram should have been well up so when the gas force is act on the cylinder cover the cylinder cover is fitted to the entablature and the entablature is held in place by these two tie rods in blue color so ultimately the upward stress by the gas forces is pulled onto the tie rods okay now the other side when the piston is being forced down the forces on the piston is translated to forces on the crankshaft and the crankshaft is being forced downward but the crankshaft is resting in the bed plate so it is the bed plate which is being forced downwards and at the bottom of the bed plate if you see it is again held by the tie rods so ultimately the gas forces which is acting upward is counterbalanced by the gas forces acting downward by the tie rod so the tie rods are the ultimate ones ultimate components which are being stressed each time the combustion takes place and there is no undue forces at the bottom of the engine that means this part of the engine is not getting any force on account of the combustion pressures that arise during combustion it is only holding the engine weight all right nothing more beyond that and consider a tin a consider a tin suppose in a bottle you have no pressure and at some stage there is more pressure the weight at the bottom is not going to change it is the upward forces and downward forces within that bottle that is going to be counteracted but there is going to be no additional force on the foundation of the engine i hope that is understandable okay now where we go here okay we were on this point large bed plates are fabricated the longitudinal boxes are like girders of mild steel the transverse girders are made of casting now when i showed you those forces ultimately those forces are acting along the central axis or central line of the crankshaft okay so it is at the center of the crankshaft and how is it taken upwards it is taken upward by the trans by the tie rod which is slightly away from the central line of the crankshaft so ultimately the transverse girder is under a bending stress the force on top and the force from the bottom is slightly off so the transverse girder is under continuous bending stress each time firing takes place so that is why it needs to be made much stronger than the longitudinal girder longitudinal girders are ultimately taking the entire pressure <coughs> of the engine weight that's all but the instantaneous forces are taken up by the tie rods remember okay i hope it is clear be able to distinguish actually i cannot show you a force <coughs> a force has to be imagined <clears throat> i cannot show you a force but i can show you a tie rod i can show you a bed plate i can show you a bearing the force has to be imagined in the tie rod it has to be imagined how it is bending the transverse girder okay that is why the transverse girder is made of cast steel because it is subject to bending stresses the the longitudinal girders are not subject to bending stresses because it is only taking the weight of the engine <clears throat> okay next part is the bed plate sits on chocks chocks are you know they provide the cushion for the engine the chocks are machined to the correct thickness finished to the correct thickness and they are kept under the bed plate and these are made of cast iron because cast iron are capable of taking enormous compressive load the modern engine they are using resin resin is a compound made by two mixtures something similar to araldite but ultimately that particular resin is very hard it is even harder than your cast iron so this resin is a, is like a is like araldite only so you can pour it inside the gap between the engine bed plate and the floor plate after the engine has been positioned and aligned with the crankshaft 
very very accurately so when this semi liquid mass fills up under the space it makes even contact on the underside of the bed plate and the top of the tank top so that entire space is filled up to the correct level while the engine is in perfect alignment whereas cast iron chalk you have to machine it measure the thickness measure the gap and then fit it in so there is possibility of error with a few microns so that error of a few microns is eliminated if you use resin chalk but this will come to much later but there are two types of chalks one is cast iron chalk one is resin chalk all right and the bed plate sits on chalk on top of the tank top in the engine room okay the transverse girders provide for main bearing seating on saddles along the center line they also hold the tie bolts in pair through passages beside the main bearing i know a lot of information is loaded in this last statement we'll go through it again you know what are transverse girders i will show you what are transverse girders again they provide for main bearing seating that means the crankshaft actually rests on the transverse girders but in the transverse girders a flat plate is provided to accommodate that bearing these transverse girders also hold the tie bolt in pairs mn has made a little change recently about 2 years back where they hold four four tie bolts for each transverse girder we will come to that later as of now two tie bolts are for each transverse girder and they pass passages beside the main bearing you will notice the transverse girders are made as close as possible to the crankshaft to minimize the bending stress on the transverse girder so let's have a look at a bed plate now these are the transverse girders what you see and these are the longitudinal girders this one is not for a two stroke engine i couldn't get a photograph of a two stroke engine bed plate but this is reasonably explanatory i do have some sketches or diagrams of a two stroke bed plate i will explain to you further but this is what a bed plate looks like what you see a flat plate here is called the saddle and in this saddle you have the thin shell bearings which are like semi circular shells and the shell is lowered in that place and then the crankshaft is laid out and each space is called the crankcase unit space for a crank web and crank pin to rotate within this if you see here there is 1 2 3 4 5 6 cylinder engine the last one over here is a little different shape and this is to accommodate the chain drive or possibly the gear drive to run the camshaft so this is not part of a unit where a piston is going to reciprocate or a crank web is going to be this is going to have a wheel over here and against that wheel you will have another idler wheel and then you will have a camshaft wheel so the actual units are within these six units so these six units are the units which accommodate each of those crank throws for every piston and cylinder liner so this center line over here has to be in perfect vertical alignment with each of these units so this alignment is very very crucial so this is the long internal member this is the transverse member if you see the holes on each transverse member here and here here and here these are the passages for the tie rods which go from the right from the bottom of the tie rod up on the top of the entablature i just now showed you how it was the diagram i have got was here yeah it goes from the bottom of the transverse girder this is the transverse girder he has not shown much of a longitudinal girder in this diagram this diagram is intended to show you how the tie rod is holding the three components so you see it is held over here by a big nut two nuts and another two nuts over there so that is why this transverse girder it is got a central force along the central axis of the crankshaft downward and upward by being pulled up by the reaction of the tie rod so this whole uh, transverse girder is under a bending stress with the force in the middle and from the sides it is being pulled upwards so that is why 
they are made of cast steel and not mild steel. So this was the bed plate I showed you, and this is a sketch of a two-stroke proper bed plate. This is the longitudinal girder, what you see, and these holes which are cut in the plates are intended to make the component lighter in weight. But at the same time, there is no compromise in the strength of that bed plate. There's a little error over here. Uh, this floor over here should have been downwards, up like that, and here. So the sum is a little lower than the actual horizontal flame. This has been made by, a, by some engineer, and I have taken it from the internet. I have a separate diagram, which is much more explanatory, which I have done it myself, and I have labeled it. Be very careful about the labeling. What you see here is the transverse girder. This dotted line, what you see, is the central axis of the crankshaft. And the holes on the transverse girder are pathways for the tie rods. So the tie rod extends with the nut is over here. And the tie rod extends through this right to the top. So this is a reasonable diagram. But I would not ask you to draw such a diagram. This is only to explain to you how the transverse girder and the longitudinal girder of a bed plate are positioned. Okay, so this is the transverse, this is the longitudinal. Next diagram is a little better. It helps in identifying all the components very easily. This is the transverse section of an actual bed plate. Okay, you will see this portion, this is called the longitudinal girder in section. Likewise, there is a longitudinal section in uh, for the longitudinal girder. The, the bed plate is seated on these two chocks. Can you see these two chocks? D. These are the chocks. And the spelling, remember, is C-H-O-C-K-S, chocks. Not C-H-O-K-E-S. The moment you write C-H-O-K-E-S, I will know you are not a DMAT guy. Because you are not being taught as C H O K E S. There are general candidates from outside. They write C H O K E S. That is not the correct spelling of chalk. It is C H O C K S. Remember. And these chalks over here are made of cast iron. And if you see the foundation bolts, there's a there's a dotted line over here. The foundation bolt are quite large diameter. It is about anything between 3 inches and 4 inches in diameter. They are quite heavy, thick bolts. And they pass from inside this chamber, which is called the coffer dam. You might have studied coffer dam in ship construction. It is a void space and it is capable for man entry. So a man can enter this space and actually check whether this bolt is tight or not. When you do foundation bolt tightening, check one person will be outside the engine. He will be using a spanner to check the nut. The nut is on the top and the bolt is fitted from underneath. More often than not, these bolts break. They break on account of fatigue failure. Why do they fail? I will explain to you. But right now we are focused on the foundation bolt. This bolt is passed through the bed plate protrusion of the bottom plate. It passes through the chalk. Actually, the chalk is in between two foundation boards. Mm, yeah, some of them actually pass through the chalks also. So the chalks are actually dimensioned to the correct thickness and then fitted in. And then the bolt is passed through. A bolt is passed through actually from down below. And what you see on top is the nut. All right. And because of regular painting, ultimately it is the paint which holds the nut in place. So when you go to actually check the tightness of the nut, you fit a spanner and moment you hit with the hammer, the nut goes flying off. What has happened is actually the bolt has broken and it has fallen inside this coffer dam. But the nut is still in place giving you a, a false of, uh, image of being there satisfactorily. It is the paint which holds the uh, nut over there. Why does it fail? Why do foundation bolts fail? This is a question that is asked often. Why do foundation bolts of engines fail? All they are doing is keeping that engine in place. That's all. It is not true. You see, when the ship is rolling, the entire engine tends to fall to either side. So when it falls to the starboard side, the port side foundation bolts are extra stressed. 
they are already pre-tensioned. But when it starts rolling, they are tensioned further because of the weight of the engine tends to go the other side. Similarly, when it starts rolling to the port side, the starboard side bolts are again tensioned. Just over a lifespan of the engine, those bolts are subject to fluctuating stresses. And fluctuating stresses are liable to fatigue failure. So most of these foundation bolts, they fail on account of fatigue failure over a period of time because of continuous pulling, stretching, leaving, putting, pulling, pulling. Now, there are two types of foundation bolts. One is called normal foundation bolt, and one is called fitted foundation bolts. All right. What they are, we will discuss later, because this requires extra explanation. So you have the fitted bolts, uh, you have the foundation bolts over here, you have the longitudinal girder here. The transverse girder is welded because it is a cast steel. It has to be welded to the mild steel. So that welding is a possible location of failure if the forces are unbalanced, if the alignment is not accurate, if there is overload of the engine, if there is any extra vibration of the engine. So these are the causes of bedroom uh, of bed plate failure. So this bed plate can fail in several places. One is the welded portion where the transverse girder is welded to the longitudinal girder. It can fail at the lower section of the transverse girder where the bending stress, that means the tensile stress is the maximum each time the gas fires. If the load is on the crankshaft, obviously this particular plate is going to be under enormous tensile stress. So this is one region of failure. The third place is the saddle over here. On account of some regular loading, it can fracture. It can fracture even though that this particular plate is cast steel and it has been welded or it has been cast in along with the transverse girder. It can fracture at this region. There are two ribs you can see over here. These are stiffeners. A plate by itself is not so stiff, but if you put ribs on the sides, it becomes much stiffer to take any compressive load. So those plates that you see which are in section are actually ribs to increase the stiffness of this transverse girder. So, so much for your uh, bed plate and you see that part of the transverse girder, it is called the bearing saddle. And the bearing is placed on top of the surface, then the crankshaft, and then, then you put the upper part of the bearing. And then you put the keep. The keep is the final arrangement to keep that bearing in place. Okay. So this is another diagram we have, which is a very simplified diagram. Over here, this diagram is showing you how to label the parts. Make sure when you label the parts, use block capital. Put an arrowhead, a simple arrowhead like he has done, and use block capital to do the labeling. Do not handwrite any diagram that you make in your engineering career, and you have to label it, use block capital. I cannot give you better advice. Now, here is a diagram which you can use in an examination. It is very well labeled, and it is a hand-drawn diagram. And what you see is the longitudinal. Actually, I have scanned this. And after scanning, it seemed to have become a little, you know, cockeyed. The whole thing has uh, become cockeyed. So anyway, it should be actually horizontal, perfectly horizontal when you actually draw the diagram. This dotted line is the dotted line for the foundation bolts. If you see, this is the transverse girder and it is welded to the longitudinal girder at this region. The longitudinal girder has cut out plates to reduce the mass or reduce the weight of the entire assembly without making a compromise on the strength of the bed plate. The dotted lines are the positions where the tie rods are passed through. I have written over here tie rod center lines. And this is the bearing saddle, what you see here. And it is a flat plate on a thin plate to accommodate the bearing shell. And bottom of the of the bed plate you see there is a plate which is attached it is bolted to the bed plate and this is a thin plate not very strong it only allows the oil to accumulate accumulate over here and from this space you have a big fat pipe which leads to the drain tank 
So all the oil which falls in the sump does not stay there. It is led into the drain tank. And that from that drain tank, again, you have an external pump which draws the oil and pumps it to various parts of the engine. All right. So much for your bed plate. Let's move on. Oh, the bed plate still continues. Little words about it. Notes. Actually, I have taken them from my notes. I would have been giving you these notes in class. But since making notes in a PowerPoint program doesn't make sense. So I've made it in points. Okay. This what is this coming up? No reply, Google. Okay. Next is the bed plate also collects the lubricating oil in the sump and returns it to the drain tank for recycling. Okay, that's understandable. It is bolted. Oh, there's a question. Just a minute. Shashwat Kumar, he's got a question. Do the transverse forces taken up by the crosshead guides? Do the transverse forces taken up by the crosshead guide also get delivered to the bolts of the foundation and add to the failures? Well, long distance it does. You see, there are H forces and Z forces. When we do first chapter in the sixth semester, we'll be going in detail with the forces or how the crankshaft extends the forces. The forces from the crankshaft is 360 degrees. It is continuously changing in all directions. But that is in-depth studies we'll have to do in the sixth semester. Right now, the transverse forces at the position you have said has a bearing on the foundation balls. It has a significant effect on the foundation balls because the transverse forces on the crosshead guides is ultimately forcing the engine to one side. And to keep that engine in place, you have braces, engine braces on the entablature of the engine on either side of the engine room walls. They are keeping the engine in place. But the forces on the crosshead, like as Shashwat Kumar says, the transverse forces taken up by the crosshead guide also get delivered to the bolts at the foundation and add to the failure. You are right. You are right. It does. It does get. But I intended to deal with these forces in your sixth semester. You have Z forces actually. When it is going upwards, when the piston is compressing, then the force is in the opposite direction. When the engine is forcing the piston down due to gas load, then the force is in the opposite direction on the crosshead. So these are also fluctuating additional forces acting on the foundation boards. You are right. Good thinking, Shashwat. That's nice. I like it. Okay. But in depth, dealing with these forces and their values, we will do in the sixth semester. Right now, okay, understand the engine. But it's not wrong of you to ask questions. Do ask more questions and get your concepts clear. It's nice to know your thinking in depth. It is bolted to the tank top, which in turn is reinforced. Where are me? Yeah, the bed plate, that is the function of the sum of the bed plate. It allows the oil to be drained into the drain tank. It is bolted to the tank top, which in turn is reinforced with thicker plates and girders. You see, the engine by itself has a huge mass, anything up to 75 to 100 tons. So the foundation on which it rests also has to be very strong. So the plates at the location where the engine is seated is much thicker plates. It is three quarter inch thick plates. While the rest of the engine room mostly has tank top of half inch thick steel plates. Apart from using these thick plates for the landing of the engine, under the plate, you have girders, that means vertical plates, which are supporting these thick plates. That will, so that these thick plates also do not bend. So I have a diagram here, which will show you how the reinforcement of the plates on which the engine is seated is laid out. You don't have to draw this in the exam and they will not ask you. This is more of understanding how the engine is placed in the engine room. Okay, it is bolted to the type Sorry. It is bolted to the tank top, which in turn is reinforced with thicker plates and girders. 
lightning holes are cut in the place to reduce weight that is why you saw the holes and the oval pass, uh, uh, openings on the plates it lightens the whole thing but at the same time designers and architects they have already calculated that the strength will not be compromised so based on their calculation these holes and cutouts are made what are the stresses in the bed plates bending stresses twisting stresses shear stresses which can cause cracks at vulnerable points i told you already the vulnerable points at which the bed plates can crack one is at the welds one is at the lower region of the transverse girder and one is at the saddle plates these are the three common areas of failure okay next what we have is the layout of the engine plates which are in the engine room suppose this is the engine room and this is one side of the seating of the bed plate one other side of the seating of the bed plate and the holding down bolts are somewhere in this region actually they should have been much in the center or little on this side so anyway i have taken this from the internet this is the best i could get www.dieselship.com so this plate what you see is much thicker but having a thick plate is not enough so you have girders at the bottom which are supporting this thick plate girders at the bottom which are supporting this thick plate and there are continuous horizontal plates to reinforce those supports this is the space which is actually called the coffer dam this coffer dam is a space actually there should have been another plate over here or this plate should have been extended right here it is not right up to this it is a horizontal surface over here so if you go in you can actually walk right around the engine this coffer dam is located right around the entire engine and it is a void space and any oil which leaks into that space has to be identified so this coffer dam space has also got a sounding pipe a sounding pipe is the pipe through which you can lower a bob right to the bottom and check if there is any oil in that tank so this is the layout of the entire engine uh, seating next let us go on to a frames the a frames is the next subject i don't want to dwell on the bed plate any longer so a frames in large crosshead engine these these frames are used to support the cylinder block which is also called the entablature from the bed plate so on top of the bed plate you have what are called a frames these are fitted at each transverse girder and at the ends of the engine obviously the transverse girders are not the end of the engine the last girder is also actually a transverse girder it has to be accommodated there so if there are actually um one two four. if there are six units how many uh, how many frames will you have okay let's have it here so this over here is of not actually a frame so there will be one two three four five six seven one will be at the end and this one is of course a cover you can consider it as a cover actually this is not there in those engine you will have another unit open in the middle to have the chain drive around so accordingly you will have the number of a frames a frames are actually located on here 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 not over here this is not an a frame likewise this will not be an a frame the a frames are actually taking the weight of the entablature and the cylinder cover both so we have finished this part we are on to this point these are fitted at the transverse girder and at the ends of the engine tie bolts pass through these a frames okay the modern engines have the frames and casings fabricated together to form a box column before attachment to the engine this is a loaded sentence the others are quite easy to understand this one is a little difficult i will tell you why modern engines have the a frames and casings fabricated together to form a box column before attachment to the engine first look at the earlier version then we'll come to this one they are erected on the bed plate as rigid structure to correct alignment of liner and crankshaft now here is your a frame what you see is an a frame this is a sketch and these are what is a photograph you see this is the bed plate over here 
and at each transverse girder you have a frames fitted in these a frames have got an extension piece over here possibly to lay out a floor plate on which makes a platform for the engineers to walk on and inspect the engine where you can see the entablature and the fuel pumps and etc so this is an extended part it's like an extended cantilever so you can actually place a floor plate over there and walk about on that surface but these are individual a frames all right now these have been gradually replaced in the modern engines with box like construction i'll show you the next diagram which shows a box like construction this is the same thing but with a box like construction now here you have the a frame which are welded together and they form a box now between the two instead of having plates over there to cover the side if you have welded plates obviously this is much much stronger as a box a monoblock unit is definitely much stronger than having frames and plates bolted onto each other so this block is then finally seated on the bed plate and on top of the a frame you have the entablature the entablatures are not a complete one block what they have is each of them is bolted to the other and as they are bolted to each other very tightly they are then placed on top of the a frame and the tie rods which pass through pass through the a through the bed plate through the a frame through the entablature to hold all of those three together in compression here is the diagram of the tie bolts holding the three components in a state of compression all right now let us go a little further on this monoblock system what he says here modern engines have frames and casings fabricated together to form a box column before attachment to the engine why do we need a stronger block of a frames when the earlier single simple a frames were working perfectly now i told you earlier that okay, i told you earlier that uh, modern engines are being longer and longer stroke engines it all coming down to fuel you know the market decides the design of the engine or rather the price of oil is what determines the design of engines that is the bottom line <clears throat> the price of fuel determines the design of engines nothing else that is primary not your inconvenience not my inconvenience it is the market forces which determine the design of the engine so what happens here when you burn poorer and poorer grades of oil the chances of complete combustion become more and more remote so you give them an opportunity by having longer and longer stroke so they give more time for the engine for the fuel to burn now if you have a longer and longer stroke <coughs> what you have is a bigger and bigger diameter of the crank web circle when it rotates then from tdc to bdc should be equal to from port starboard both sides because it's a circular movement of the crank so <clears throat> the angularity of the connecting rod again becomes a factor and therefore <clears throat> the transverse force becomes much larger because the increased angle of the connecting rod now if the transverse become much stronger or much bigger you need to have a much bigger support for the guide and guide shoe and to have a plate simply holding to take the force of the guide and guide shoe is not enough you need to make that plate very very strong and only way to make it very strong is to have a monoblock arrangement with thick plates welded together with all the units and they are capable of taking that increased transverse force arising out of longer stroke of engines i hope it is clear shashrat kumar are you able to understand why we need monoblock a frames rather than simple plate type of a frames which were being earlier shashrat kumar okay good that's nice these are finer points which you boys must be able to explain any time you come up with these questions and you will come up with these questions at the professional level whether it is now whether it is later you will come across okay
next is what we have this is the diagram which is the original a frame this is the older version we had a frames like this and then we had plates joining all of them together and those plates were also holding the crankcase doors now we have solid blocks over here and the crankcase doors are much lower right here so this solid arrangement is what you call a mono block arrangement of the a frames and they are capable of taking transverse forces on a much higher scale and that has become necessary because of the longer and longer stroke the engines are being produced at okay next they will, oh i have already explained it here so you don't have to write down anything everything is written and they are written from the time we have our actual um, notes development of long stroke and super long stroke and ultra super long stroke now if you have a pencil and paper write down these figures long stroke is between 2.6 to 3.2 that means for every meter diameter of the bore you have a stroke of 2.6 to 3.2 that means the stroke to bore ratio is 2.6 to 3.2 it is considered as long stroke super long stroke will be anything from 3.2 to 4 Point seven. That is called super long stroke. An ultra super long stroke will be anything in excess of four point seven. M A N B N W figures. These are M A N B N W figures to describe what is long stroke, what is super long stroke, and what is ultra super long stroke. So as these developments have been taking over in time. as the price of oil goes longer the stroke of the engine becomes longer very very and un not unusual but you no know, that's how the logic explains the situation all right <clears throat> uh development on has increased lateral forces on the guide this is due to the relatively short connecting rod to reduce the overall height moment you shorten the connecting rod the angularity of that connecting rod becomes much more okay uh, you can draw it on a piece of paper and see with a long connecting rod and a short connecting rod with a short connecting rod because the piston rod itself is very long you can't have a long piston rod and a long connecting rod then the engine will go out of the ship also it will become so tall you can you have to compromise with the height of the engine at the same time accommodate the longer stroke of the engine so only place you can compromise is make the connecting rod as small as you can but you can't make it too small you cannot make it too small where the cross rail will come and hit the crankshaft okay so the result is an increased angle of connecting rod to the central axis understandable this increase causes larger lateral forces which require to be addressed with a mono block structure because the mono block structure is much stronger and because the lateral forces are become much higher the advantages of the mono block structure is greater structural rigidity obviously it will be a much more rigid body more accurate alignment of the crossing moment it is more rigid the alignment is also improved third one is improved force distribution in the structure that means the forces on all the components will be much more evenly distributed not that because of misalignment of one one gets more force and the other one gets less force that is eliminated and number 4 is improved oil tightness if you see in this structure you have lot of plates which are bolted onto these surfaces separate plates are bolted now these surfaces which are bolted over a time period the oil which is splashing inside the crankcase will fall on the internal surfaces and there will be gradual seepage there will be gradual seepage of oil coming outwards so i remember in my old ships we used to have the oil man out of the 4 hours of duty 2 and 1/2 hours he is only wiping the engine and amount of cloth we used to consume for wiping the engine was unbelievable so then if you don't wipe the engine at the end of the watch the next engineer will come and say why we have left me a dirty engine so that was being caused because of 
poor oil tightness between the surfaces which are bolted together less number of surfaces you have which are bolted together better is the improved oil tightness okay next diagram does not have much of a meaning i think i will delete it but we will skip on to it now here is the diagram of forces you have a top force and the guide resultant force all expressed in the form of a triangle in the crosshead type of engine in the trunk type of engine this horizontal force is taken up by the trunk portion of the engine the gas forces act here ultimately is transited here so the horizontal forces are activated here i think we are coming to the end of the class i already 1109 you might be having another class so here is an arrangement where the bed plate the mono block a frames and the individual entablatures which are bolted together within themselves are held together by means of a tie bolt this gives you a final picture of how the three are assembled but it is in a dismantled condition you have the a frames you have the bed plate you have the tie rod which is seen inside it is going through the holes in the transverse girder it is going through the frames of the a frame and it is finally going through the cylinder jacket so there is a nut over here and a nut over here to keep the three of them in absolute tightness these tie bolts are also called stay bolts they keep the cylinder block that is the entablature the a frames and the bed plate in compression tie bolt center should be as close as possible to the crankshaft this reduces bending stress on the transverse girders and prevents unbalanced forces being transmitted to the welds all right the gas pressure loads from the cylinder covers are transmitted to the bed plates through these tie bolts two tie bolts are fitted through each transverse girder and pass through the a frame cylinder block where the locking knots are hydraulically tightened that means you get very accurate tightening of the tie bolts all right now here is the final statement the tie bolts hold the cylinder block entablature a frame and bed plate in compression i have repeated it but i have given it with the diagram the gas forces from the combustion chamber are balanced off in the upward direction and downward direction no extra forces are suffered on by the foundation bolt of the bed plate due to i should have been due to gas forces okay the upward forces in the cylinder cover are taken up by the studs which are bolted to the entablature the cylinder cover is a separate body over here do not ever make the mistake of attaching the cylinder cover with the tie rods tie rods do not hold the cylinder cover in place the, the cylinder cover is held in place by separate studs and these studs are fitted on the entablature the downward forces are taken on the piston piston rod connecting rod crankshaft to the bed plate so the downward forces are taken also by the tie rods where the forces are concerned the tie rods are subject to fluctuating stresses during each combustion cycle all right how are they tightened the tie rods have a particular sequence of tightening now there are three engines i have given you first one is the sulzer second one is mnbnw third one is also mnbnw but different models now <clears throat> in the first one you see the first two tie rod that are tightened are the one at the center then the one beside that then you go on the other side and tighten number 3 then number 4 then number 5 then number 5 5 this side 6 6 this side 7 so from the center it is proceeding outwards in the sequence of tightening the tie rods same path is followed by the mn bnw engine the more recent or more uh, recent arrangement you have actually four tie rods for each transverse girder so these four tie rods for each transverse girder where there is one hole you will have two holes so this has shown better support of the tie rod less bending of the tie rod better stress management by the tie rods so that is why the more modern design has got two tie rods on each side of each transverse girder so each transverse girder has got four tie rods this is a more modern concept but your concept of the earlier tie rod arrangement is quite adequate this is a 
question which can be placed for class 2 level in the examination. So various builders have their procedures of tightening the tie board. Most common starting from the center and they move on over to outward in sequence shown. That is the way it is. All right. Any questions you have? Let me know. I've already taken up a little extra time. It's 11.14. Sir, uh, if there are two stock in inside I3 driven, so if, does that mean that there, uh, there requires no gear to move forward and stun? I'm not able to understand your question. Go slowly and very clearly. Sir, you said that the two stock engines are directly driven. Generally, they are directly driven. Correct. Yes. Yes, sir. So, so does that mean that they don't need any gears to move forward and astern? No, there are no reduction gears in the two stroke engine which is driving the propeller directly. But there are gears within the engine which the crankshaft drives to drive the camshaft because the camshaft also has to rotate. So the only gears that are there in the two stroke engine are intended to drive the camshaft. Otherwise, there are no reduction gears to reduce or increase the propeller RPM. Whatever the RPM the engine is running at, same is the propeller rotation RPM. So the propeller choice and engine choice has to be made together when building a ship. Okay. Okay. Any other question? Any other questions? Okay. You go proceed for your next class. We will say all present for this class. So I'm putting it down as all present. Very good. Thank you for coming. And we hope you repeat you, your you repeat your attendance in the next class. Today is the seventh. Okay. Bye bye. Take care of your health. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay.